here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello there, I'm Leo Shanahan, tonight bringing you the full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet. Coming up. We're absolutely determined to make sure that no customer is charged for a service that they haven't received. Bad behaviour still front of mind. This is Commonwealth Bank's first ha half results failed to meet, meet analyst expectations as shares dip after yesterday's big gains. We'll discuss those results and get the bank's response to Commissioner Haynes' final recommendations with CEO Matt Common. Tiki Fulton will have that interview shortly. RBA Governor Philip Lowe indicating a move towards neutral policy now accepting a possible rate cut ahead. We'll get analysis on that game-changing speech with the Australian's Adam Crichton. And Microsoft Australia partners with the New South Wales Government on AI. Microsoft Australia Managing Director Stephen Worrell coming up a little later in the program. But first, Commonwealth Bank failing to meet analyst expectations today despite seeing a slight increase in their first half profits for 2019. Cash profit came in at $4.67 billion, up 1.7%. Net profit after tax was $4.6 million, with the bank posting a net interest margin of 2.1%, four basis points lower than the previous half on higher funding costs and home loans switching and competition. Expenses were lower, but the bank was hurt by further compliance and remediation costs related to the Austrac penalties. CEO Matt Common acknowledged the need to implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission. No surprises there. He also said the housing market is undergoing a rational transition, especially following outpaced growth in some markets, and that credit quality remains sound. On that, the bank saw 4% growth in home lending, helping to offset declines in other banking income, which dropped 5%, hit by reduced fees and lower trading volumes. Shareholders will see a flat interim dividend of $2. CBA shares closing just lower today at $72.66, down 1.28%. Of course, off the back of those big highs yesterday. Well, for more of the results, Tiki Fulton sat down with CBA CEO Matt Common just moments ago. Matt Common, I'll come to the results in a minute. But uh, on the Hain report release, CBA shares were up 5%. Does that reflect how you see what the Royal Commission uh, is doing for CBA? Well, what I really feel about the Royal Commission process is how thorough and rightfully critical it's been. And over the last 12 months, we've seen some harrowing examples of misconduct and the impact on our customers. I've met with a number of those customers. I think the recommendations are very thoughtful and clear. Do you I'm think your customers are happy with the, the outcome now? Well, I'm very focused on implementing the recommendations. I hope that many customers see the importance of the recommendations that are put forward. I'm sure that many customers also feel like I'd like to see it when I can judge you by your actions, not necessarily what's in the report, and I think that's a very fair starting position. Mm. You, uh, the bank was referred to regulators in the report. Uh, have you had any legal advice about whether there'll be you know, any, any detail on that, any potential for criminal prosecutions at all? Well, there's a number of matters, as you said, that have been referred to ASIC across all the financial institutions. Mm. Of course, that, that's ultimately in the hands of ASIC, and we await... Uh, what they'd like to do next. Of course, we'll cooperate uh, wherever necessary. From our perspective, we're getting on with ensuring that we're implementing as many of the recommendations as we possibly can, getting to the root cause of issues and demonstrating to our customers that we're a better bank for them. Mm. One of the things to come out was that there was no ban of vertical integration. Now, add that to the, the recommendations around mortgage brokers and um, mortgage choice, uh, which you've, uh, you're busy trying to demerge, fell up 30% on this news. Are you at all rethinking the demerger of uh, CFS, which includes Aussie loans and home loans and mortgage choice? Well, as I said earlier today, we've announced the demerger. We announced that we intend to demerge at the end of this year. Mm. Uh, we've appointed a CEO. Our CEO, Jason Yetton, started working closely with the team. I think they're making good progress on the transition and separation. Because what's being spun off is not nearly um, as valuable as it was before these recommendations, is it? We're also very conscious of the recommendations and working our way through that. And we're going to make sure that we set up any business and this business for success. 
Okay. Uh, you, you, you say today, you said in this interview already, we'll work constructively with the government and regulators. Uh, now, Matt, uh, ASIC uh, um, jumped on you the day of the uh, Hain report release um, about Commonwealth financial planning and your enforceable undertaking there. ASIC is now banning uh, your financial planners from charging service fees for services until you sort it out. Why did you fail to deliver after everything? Well, it's an unacceptable failure, Tiki. There's no uh, better explanation than that. We've made a number of improvements to our advice business. We've made some clear commitments uh, to ourselves and to the regulator for the 31st of January. We wrote to the regulator telling them that we hadn't, which I accept is an inexplicable failure. Uh, the consequences of that are very clear. There's no disagreement between ourselves and, and the regulator. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're going to look very hard at how that could have possibly happened. Mm -hmm. And as you'd expect, there'll be consequences that will flow from that. Right, because it is, as you say, it's, it's inexplicable after Austrac, after, after the many scandals that there have been. That's right, and particularly in an area of our business where there's been a number of issues. Of course, we're absolutely determined to make sure that no customer is charged for a service that they haven't received. Mm -hmm. And as I said, there were a number of improvements that were made. We've changed the business model so that we're only charging customers for a service after it's been provided. Mm -hmm. But there are also a number of steps in what are known as controls to strengthen the overall uh, business. Mm -hmm. And we fell short on a number of those, and there's no escaping that that is unacceptable and it's a failure that we need to look into. Matt Common, you, you were asked during the Royal Commission, had the right people in charge at C, had the right people been in charge at CBA? Uh, you said no, your predecessor Ian Narev left and, and in you came. I'm wondering if you had been criticised by Kenneth Hayne, like Andrew Thorburn and like Ken Henry were, if that had been you, would you offer to resign? I wouldn't like to speculate and certainly I wouldn't provide any commentary on one of my competitors. Of course, what I'm very focused on, and I do not underestimate the size of the task that's ahead of us, responding to the issues and the failures of the Commonwealth Bank and, of mm. course, across the broader industry. We've got 35 clear recommendations from the Prudential Inquiry that we've announced today, the, the last uh, independent expert report. Mm. We're making good progress, but there's still a lot of work to do. And, of course, the Royal Commission's recommendations, which we're setting about implementing as quickly as we can. Just uh, to your uh, results, I think summed up as weaker top line and stronger bottom line. Uh, what about the pressures on your top line? And in particular, I thought your outlook was, was quite sunny side up. Uh, the economy strong, credit quality strong. Today we've had the governor of the RBA. He's revising his uh, GDP forecast down. Does that change your outlook? Well, I note the governor's comments, and I, I still believe the Australian economy is performing well, that GDP growth of close to 3%, a falling unemployment rate, underemployment falling, we're starting to see a pick-up in wages, you know, modest growth in, in consumption. I, I acknowledge that, and I think, having not had the chance to study the governor's comments closely, I suspect he's highlighted a few risks to the downside of the Australian and global economy. Mm. Of course, he's the expert, um, and I... And I would certainly take note of the comments that he's made. My personal view is that rates are likely to be on hold for 2019, but of course there are risks to the domestic and global economy. Mm. I mean, the, the other thing the RBA governor said today, big news, he's now saying it's 50-50 as to whether the next move of the bank is, is up or down. If it is down, will CBA move down very swiftly after that as well? Well, as you'd appreciate, I, I'm not able to talk about any pricing decisions that we might take in the future. There's very clear legal restrictions, but certainly we, we would think about uh, a number of different factors, including what the economic conditions were, and, and it would lead to a deterioration in economic conditions if the governor was to reduce the rate. We would certainly weigh that up across a number of factors. We know how important the standard variable rate is to our customers mm -hmm. and how important it is for us to be able a to demonstrate. And the politics of it all at the moment. Here we are, an election campaign too. Of course, but first and foremost for us, it's what's the right decision for our customers and the long-term interests of the Commonwealth Bank. We're very cognizant of the fact we need to be able to demonstrate better outcomes and a mm. better balance for our customers, sustainable returns for our shareholders, but ultimately our overall obligation is to our customers. Matt, there are pressures and they are increasing indeed on, on the bank. Uh, we've seen, for example, National Australia Bank in recent times announce a huge restructuring, 6,000 jobs going. Are you planning any major cuts this year, major, major, major job losses this year? 
Well, as I said today, there's nothing on the horizon from our perspective. Of course, ensuring that we're competitive and well positioned for the future, because inevitably banking, like many industries, is going to come under intense competition. Of course, that's great news for, for customers. And so we want to make sure that we're continuing to invest. Of course, we'll look for opportunities to operate more efficiently and effectively. But what I'm most focused on is making sure that we're fixing any issues from the past and ensuring that they don't reoccur and delivering better customer and risk outcomes. Let me come back to the RBA Governor who was also talking about uh, or answering a question on the high bank return on equities that there are in Australia, ROEs. Yours is I think 13.8 percent. He says overseas bankers tell him about 10 percent is, is more the norm. Uh, he's not sure why Australian banks are higher and he doesn't know how long that's sustainable. Do you know? Well, there are some very uh, big differences depending on uh, different markets, but I acknowledge, as you said, our return on equity is 13.8 percent. Mm -hmm. There certainly are other markets that are similar, markets like Canada, which has a number well, of... Well, that's the, the one country that's called out, isn't right. it? Right. There's a number of similarities between Australia uh, and Canada. Can it continue? Well, return on equities have come down about 700 basis points or seven percentage points uh, over the last decade. We've, a big part of that, of course, has been substantially increasing uh, capital. And we also have to bear that in the context of the Australian banks and the Australian economy have benefited from 27 years of uninterrupted economic growth. So one of the things that can turn very quickly in a banking system is profitability when economic conditions deteriorate and credit losses rise and sometimes rise very sharply. On the uh, property market, you talked about a fairly orderly correction. On the broader economy, though, there are concerns, you can see it with the comments from the Treasurer, about the tightening of credit access to finance, particularly for small businesses. Is this a major risk to the economy? And as the biggest bank, can you do something about it? We're certainly very cognizant of ensuring that we are making available credit for credit for customers that we can, both in personal, and I spent quite a bit of time at the results briefing today talking through our own experience. This is particularly the case, <coughs> excuse me, for business customers who are, of course, the lifeblood, small businesses, the lifeblood of the Australian economy, both in terms of employment as well as GDP. And I know that some of those experiences, they've found it more challenging. Uh, it's a more intensive uh, inquiry process from banks going mm -hmm. through credit, particularly, I think, at the smaller end. We're very focused on ensuring that we can uh, provide both very good service as well as uh, very quick access to funds for small business customers and that's a real focus for us going forward. Okay, uh, obviously we've got an election coming up, uh, Matt. Uh, now I'm, I'm just wondering, one of the things, franking credits, negative gearing if Labor get in, but also Labor uh, looks to be forcing companies to compare the CEO's pay with that of a median worker. Uh, you must know roughly what that number is. What is it and, and how will that impact things? Do you think that sort of transparency? Well, it's approximately $80,000 for a median uh, employee inside the Commonwealth Bank. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm aware of those comments. I think uh, those sorts of comparisons uh, and transparency have been called for before. Mm -hmm. I have to say that my, personally my compensation is the furthest thing from my mind at the moment. I'm very focused on ensuring that we're able to demonstrate to our customers that we're a better bank for them and getting on with the Commission's recommendations. Finally, I should just ask you one on, on, on mortgages, um, because if those recommendations do come through as Labor would like them to, uh, there's been some suggestion um, that mortgage brokers are going to really suffer and that that will benefit the banks. Well, I think first and foremost, the mortgage broking industry are very important. They've provided uh, a real service to the Australian customers over the last 20 years, and it's really important that they are able to prosper into the future. Yeah. My personal view, and it was examined during the Royal Commission, is that I believe the Commission's recommendations will improve customer outcomes. I think that can be done in a way without uh, deterioration to the mortgage broking channel, and of course the timing around those recommendations is ultimately in the hands of the government. It sure is. Matt Common, thank you very much for talking to me. Thanks a lot, Tiki. Well, after the break, a policy shift flag from RBA Governor Philip Lowe. We'll get across the details with The Australian's economics editor, Adam Crichton. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Well, RBA Governor Philip Lowe today used a speech at the National Press Club to signal a significant shift to neutral policy outlook, with the governor acknowledging increased local and global economic risks, now accepting the potential for a rate cut ahead. 
Looking forward, there are scenarios where the next move in the cash rate is up and there are other scenarios where it's down. Over the past year, the next move is up scenarios were more likely than the next move is down scenarios. Today, the probabilities appear to be more evenly balanced. Our economy is benefiting from strong growth in infrastructure investment and an upswing in other areas of private investment. The labour market's also strong and many people are finding jobs. This year we'll also benefit from an uplift in LNG exports. The lower exchange rate and a lift in commodity prices is also helping. But against this generally positive picture, the major domestic uncertainty is the strength of consumption and the housing market. The RBA has kept the cash rate on hold at a record low 1.5% for two and a half years in an attempt to avoid encouraging heavily indebted households from borrowing further. Sydney property prices have fallen more than 12% since July 2017. On housing, Lowe said he expects a pickup in household disposable income to offset the impact of lower housing prices. Housing prices simply increased to the point in Sydney and Melbourne where demand tailed off as purchasing a home had become more expensive and had become a less inv attractive investment uh, option for many people. A second factor is that the building boom over recent times has significantly increased the supply of housing. It took a number of years before the rate of home construction picked up in response to faster population growth, but eventually it did pick up and that's affecting prices. In my view, this explains much of the cycle. A third factor is that demand for overseas investors softened, partly in response to the Chinese authorities making it more difficult to move money out of China. And a fourth factor is that lending standards have been tightened and credit has become more difficult to access for some people. Well, for more on this, I'm now joined by the Australian's economic editor, Adam Crichton. Adam, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, now, firstly, I've got a bugbear on this. Uh, why didn't Phil Lowe put this in uh, the minutes yesterday after the meeting? I mean, I just have to stand in front of the RBA and, and, and talk <laughs> about these minutes, which aren't really saying much. Why do it uh, today? Well, look, in fairness to the RBA, there were quite a few changes to the yeah. structure of of that statement, but, but you're quite right. The final paragraph, the crucial final paragraph, which kind of everyone obsesses over, wasn't changed. And so most people yesterday afternoon, yourself included probably, were saying that the next move would be up, mm. uh, would still be part of their bias. But that's, that's not the case now. They've changed it, so there's a big move in the Australian dollar today. And I think one rate cut is now fully priced in, actually, uh, for the next 12 months. So there's been a big change in financial markets following this speech today. Look, I, I mean, just, just to answer your question, I think it's probably a function of the fact that internally the RBA doesn't actually pay as much attention to these statements as we do as journalists. Yeah. Uh, the language we obsess over, but I think they've said a number of times in statements they don't pay as much attention to it as we do. Yeah. Okay, I should say you're a former RBA economist yeah, so as I, well I in your younger <laughs> years. However, look, w overall, what did you make of the significance of this speech? As you said, the market might be pricing in a cut. Are you of the view now that the next move will be down? Well, look, of course, prediction is so hard. Yeah. And I do think it was so brave at the Reserve Bank last year. Well, actually, you know, you could probably say silly um, as well as brave to go out on a limb, I think, ahead of most forecasters and say that the economy was going to grow 3.5% this year and 3.5% next mm. year. Whereas, of course, now they're saying it'll be more like 3 this year and slightly lower next year. Uh, they were definitely at the optimistic end of all economic forecasters. Now, you you can understand to some extent why a nation's central bank is going to be optimistic because, of course, if it's being pessimistic, people will ask questions, well, you know, go and do something about it. Uh, but even given that, I think they were still a little too optimistic. So it's just reality catching up mm. with their statements. You know, we've had poor building approvals data. We've had poor retails data. The growth rate of the economy slumped quite dramatically in the most yeah. recent quarter we had. Uh, and, of course, there's all these risks overseas as well. So I think the RBA now is just saying, well, look, on, on the balance of probabilities, the bias is neutral, although I actually think that the bias is probably to a cut, and yeah. indeed, certainly, that's what markets think. Well, as you said, I mean, they had to downgrade the GDP growth. They've also had to downgrade inflation, but they're also saying that unemployment will be lower than they expected. Do you not see a contradiction there? Well, look, just on inflation, I think they've basically kept the outlook largely the same, but they're just saying that we get back to 2% more slowly than they thought uh, a few months ago. I mean, the reality is inflation has continually failed to meet their forecasts. So mm. that's kind of an embarrassment, really, because that's their core function, really, yeah. kind of forecasting inflation and controlling it. Um, uh, 
Uh, just in terms of, sorry, what was the, uh, the other part you asked me? Oh, just the bringing down GDP forecasts and also, but at the same time, saying unemployment will continue ah, yes, to, to go. Yeah, well, I mean, it's obviously market. their key data point, right? Yeah, well, certainly the job market has been the bright spot of the Australian economy. I mean, the, the unemployment rate's hovered around 5% for a while now, which for Australia is pretty good. The RBA says that it will go down to 4.75% sometime later this year or early next year. That yeah. would be very good by... Uh, by historical standards for Australia. But then again, it is in keeping with what's been happening in the US and the UK, where we're seeing extremely low unemployment rates. But of course, the reality is the, you know, the, the improved employment situation here has not led to faster wage growth. Now, the yeah. RBA has kept the same statement that you know, wage growth is coming. Uh, they've been saying that for a very long time. Uh, the government said that today, but the reality is it's still not really happening. So, so if we don't get more wage growth, I think in the next four or five months, um, I think you'll almost certainly see a cut. Yeah. Now, look, Phil Lowe was also asked about bank profitability, which I thought was interesting. Obviously, in the context of the Royal Commission, he said the Royal Commission hands down a balanced and sensible report. No real surprise there. However, he was asked how long it is viable for Australian banks to keep earning uh, on their price equity ratios mm. compared to banks in the, especially basically US and Europe, uh, because they do earn significantly more, well, generally speaking, more. Now, this is what he had to say in response to that. At the moment, the Australian banks are earning roughly 13% return on equity. Uh, when I talk to overseas bankers and I ask them what return of equity they're, they're targeting, and a number around 10 is common. So the Australian banks still have higher returns on equity than many international banks. Uh, I don't know how long that's sustainable. Whether uh, extra competition in the system will drive that over time, or maybe they've just got low credit losses at the moment and so they've got high returns on equity. But it is a good question to ask, or to contemplate, why it is that the Australian banks can earn, on average, higher rates of return on equity than similar banks overseas. Now, Adam, you quite like this subject, of bank profitability in Australia. Why is it that it's so much easier for Australian banks to make money? Well, look, it's a very good question. I don't really have a definitive answer for it. I mean, he's right. I mean, the Commonwealth Bank's uh, return, I think, was 13.4%. And I think, you know, most of the major banks of the US, it's more like 8 or 9%. Yeah. I mean, it's even lower in Europe. I mean, is there something kind of wrong with Australians that means that they don't kind of look around for better deals? Mm. I mean, kind of at the end of the day, I mean, Phil Lowe is right to talk about competition. I mean, you know, there are... There are alternatives out there. There are lower rates out there for mortgages. Uh, there are higher rates for your deposit account. But for some reason, people keep going to the big four all the time. Yeah. And that basically gives them all of this market power, which in turn leads to these extraordinary returns. Yeah, we see Commonwealth Bank uh, doing very well. Thank you very much exactly. today. And the shares exactly. rocketing, obviously, exactly. even though they're Amazing. down a bit today. But anyway, Adam Crichton, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Leo. All right. Well. Moving to agriculture now, it's been a year of drought and flooding rain as Do in Dorothy McKellar proportions, Australia's top agribank, Rabobank, recently released its flagship agribusiness outlook for the year, flagging considerable headwinds and risk to downside after our recent good run. And it was less to do with the weather and a lot more to do with global growth and trade deals. For analysis, Tiki Fulton spoke with Outlook's author, with Outlook's author, Rabobank General Manager of Rabo Research, Tim Hunt. Tim Hunt, uh, hello there. Before I come to your great report, can you give us a sense of how important agriculture is to the national income these days and whether it's going to become more important or not? It's not a dominant sector it was 50, 100 years ago, but it's an important sector for the Australian economy. It is a growing sector for the Australian economy mm. with opportunities such as tech flowing into the, the sector, attracting a lot of interest. And also it's a very important earner of offshore um, earnings uh, for our economy, um, which helps us. Um, and finally, I'd say uh, it is an important value adder as well these days that doesn't always follow the other parts of our economy, so it can help us out of a jam sometimes mm. um, when the rest of the economy isn't doing so well. So well, an important part of the economy. Right. Well, in terms of, you know, producing our soft commodities, I mean, we've been on a pretty good run, fair to say, in the last little while. Um, what is your outlook and how risky are things in the, in the near term? We have been on, on a good run, largely due to a sustained period of global economic growth and China's rising appetite both for food and beverages and quality food and beverages. 
we see ourselves in agriculture still on a good medium term path so multiple years still to come of, of, of growing offshore demand increase access to those markets and things like the China Free Trade Agreement and the TPP and investment flowing in to help us capitalize on those things. But what we see more immediately in 2019 is more headwinds than we were facing 12 months ago and a number of downside risks that, that are starting to look a bit disconcerting for the coming 12 months. Okay, chief among them uh, seems to be China and growth. You really think that e even though um, we hear these numbers, who, who knows whether they're right or not, but, but like a 6% growth is, is still, uh, you're, you're concerned about the slowing growth in China? Yes, we are, and on a number of levels. One, uh, along with many others, uh, we, we find it hard to reconcile that sort of 6% growth in GDP or 8% growth in retail sales by what's actually happening on, on the ground and what companies are reporting. Uh, you would have seen, uh, Tiki, last week, companies such as Apple, Ford, Caterpillar, 3M, Black & Decker all report significant downgrades in their sales into mm. the Chinese economy. We're concerned that the economy is growing much slower than the, the Chinese official stats suggest, uh, that it's likely to go further down, and, and we're looking to see whether that impacts food and beverage sales, um, along with all these other products that, that are clearly slowing down significantly. And presumably some part of that, uh, some element of that, will be the China-US uh, trade negotiations or t tensions. How does that feed into our agricultural position? That's uh, disconcerting for us also. It will magnify the slowdown in the Chinese economy if that trade war uh, continues to escalate. Um, but also just in straight agricultural terms, it's hard to see how we win out of this. Um, if the trade war gets worse, then we're seeing a drift away from an open-based trading system from which we've benefited so much. Uh, but if it's resolved, there's also a risk. It's resolved in a manner which sees the China t agree to buy much more agricultural products from China in coming years, which may be at the expense of our own trade flows. So, right. uh, do, you, do, you see really that as, do you see that as a likely scenario? I see it as entirely possible. Mm. Yes, we've already openly seen the Chinese uh, offer to buy substantially more uh, soybeans and, and, um, and gas uh, from the United States. Mm. Uh, there's likely also uh, to be pledges to buy things like um, beef, cotton, um, and probably some directive to their companies to look favorably uh, at a range of other U.S. products. So the Chinese aren't necessarily going to just increase consumption of those things just because they have to buy more from the U.S. So someone will end up losing. And in terms of our own spats that we've got with China, particularly on the barley front, I mean, we think of anti-dumping concerns by the Chinese in Australia when it comes to things like steel. They, I understand, have their own investigation running as far as our barley is concerned. That's right. And the timelines around that are hard to pick. They have some time to really decide whether to uh, go ahead with punitive, um, effectively, tariffs on our, on our barley. And we saw uh, last year them impose what amounted to a 170% um, price um, penalty against U.S. sorghum for a while, which they said was being dumped. We don't know how this one's going to play out. Uh, but that's another significant downside risk that could materially impact uh, one of our major offshore trade flows. And, and is this a real non-tariff barrier that might come up, or, or have we been dumping? Well, what, what from the evidence we see, there's not a strong case to suggest that Australian barley was jump, dumped into the Chinese market. Uh, that's unfortunately going to be largely their decision. Australian yeah. companies uh, have had till uh, early February to submit their views. Uh, but it may be politics that ultimately decides uh, whether they choose to, to pull that lever. All right. Well, politics, politics. Uh, the other uh, big trade deal that may or may not happen, of course, is, is Brexit. Uh, you're concerned yeah. that under a no-deal scenario, that could also impact Australia. In what way? Well, the European economy is already technically in recession. A, a, a no-deal Brexit would throw the UK into recession uh, as well. So we're already starting to stress the incomes of consumers in those big trading blocks, which will impact sales uh, of our products that we send in there, particularly, say, wine into the UK, canola into Europe. 
What we're concerned about on top of that is the mayhem that, that's going to surround how supply chains operate and start to impact, uh, for example, uh, the way we manage shipments of wine into the UK for transshipment into Europe. So we have a lot to gain um, from uh, a, a, a rapid um, and smooth transition out of the EU for, for Britain. So Tim, does that make you a Remainer? Because uh, there's also the great opportunity of a, of a free trade agreement uh, with England, of course, by Australia. Yeah. Well, I'm, well, I don't have a vote, unfortunately, in either country, <laughs> but uh, I, I do think that um, Australian agriculture would have benefited most um, from the UK remaining in the market, for the very least because it's a known uh, quantity of risks. Uh, we may end up better from the separation. It will probably take us years to work that out, but there's considerable risk we'll end up worse long time, and in the short term, we'll absolutely experience um, some ripples to our trade in the market as they navigate a very difficult situation there. Tim Hunt, it's great to get your insights and we look forward to ABARES and a little bit more data. So perhaps come back and talk to us then too. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tiki. Well, after the break, we'll dive into super changes recommended by Commissioner Haynes' final report. As for CEO, Martin Fay will join me live at the desk. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Welcome back. Well, moving now to superannuation and High Commissioner Kenneth Hayne has made several recommendations in his final report that may prove to shake up the super industry. Hayne has put out a total of nine recommendations. He was recommending the hawking of super products through bank, bank branches be banned. Also put a change to the default super system with superannuants only ever allowed to default into one fund and a recommendation that the law be changed to prevent funds from offering employers incentives in exchange for becoming a nominated fund. So what will these changes potentially mean for the super sector? Joining me now at the desk is Martin Fay, CEO of the Association of Super Funds of Australia. Martin, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now look, we'll get to some of those specific changes or recommendations in a moment. Does it worry you though that some of the most egregious behaviour that emerged uh, from the Royal Commission to do had to do with superannuation accounts and trustees, and trustees seemingly not being aware of their duty uh, to the people whose accounts they are in charge of. When you look at the Commissioner's report, he was obviously very strident in his criticism and his critique of conduct across the sector. I think, he, though, he was very careful, considered and measured in the recommendations that he's made. And from our point of view, this will take what is recognised as a world-class retirement funding system and make it even stronger. That's not to say the recommendations, particularly in the area of managing conflicts and the regulatory architecture, aren't going to improve things. They definitely are. But I think what he's saying is that the system's not broken. We, have a, we are tantalisingly close to having a well-funded retirement mm -hmm. system. And the changes he's making are really about managing those vexed issues of conflicts management removing the regulatory ambiguity that's there between the two main regulators. I'll, I'll just read you a bit from the report, which I'm sure you're aware of. He says, it should be concerning to regulators that professional trustees apparently struggle to understand their most fundamental obligation. Does that worry you? He then goes on to say superannuation can no longer be seen only as a compact between employees and one or more employers. It is, per, it is important to the whole nation. He's recognising that the funds under management in superannuation are now $2.7 trillion. Mm. The OECD has as recently as December said that this is a system that's on track to deliver. And what he's saying is that, you know, $2.7 trillion, if it justifies anything, it justifies humility and it justifies a professional approach which puts members at the centre of it. So if we look at the legislative and regulatory architecture, the CIS Act, the Superannuation Act that governs superannuation funds, puts very specific duties on trustees to act in the member interest. And what Hain, I think, is doing is saying that the evidence that presented suggests that there are trustees there who haven't necessarily been able to manage the conflicts. And he's also pointed to the regulators in saying the ambiguity between APRA, our prudential regulator, and ASIC, our 
conduct regulator needs to be made much clearer. Okay, so let's go to one of the recommendations. No more default funds, or sorry, one default mm -hmm. fund. Your view of that from the top, because it is going to attract or has attracted some criticism uh, from the uh, industry super funds. I think at the, at the outset, if we step back on this issue, this is designed to address the issue of what is known as, the, if you like, a proliferation of unintended accounts. Mm. The average Australian, the typical Australian, has one superannuation account. What this is trying to do is address the vexed issue of where people end up with multiple accounts. What we need to do is we need a situation, and one of the things your viewers can do is you go to the MyGov website and you can consolidate those, and the industry's been making great strides in recent years to consolidate accounts. What's been proposed here is that where people don't choose a fund, that they will be defaulted once into a, a fund and that that would stay with them uh, for the duration. And that mirrors some of the recommendations of the Productivity Commission. I think what you've seen in recent days right across the political spectrum is a recognition that there might be some unintended consequences to that and that there are a variety of mechanisms. It's also proposed that that will only apply to people entering the workforce. Um, we still have this issue of how do we make sure that we don't have proliferation of accounts. The best way for people to do that is take control, go onto the MyGov website, check where your super fund money is and if necessary consolidate it up. Okay, what about these anti-hawking laws, about the sale of superannuation products in the, in the banks? You, you're in favour of those recommendations? I think what the Commissioner is saying that superannuation as a compulsory system which is inherently you know, about occupational pensions, that as a, a, a compulsory system he clearly has a view about how that should be presented to people and what he's saying is that we need more people engaged uh, and while we have diversity in the system and we've got a very, very substantial amount of money under management, we want to make sure that people are getting the, the, the right introduction to super. So it should, should be banned from the sale, point of sale of the bank? Well, I, I think, you know, what everybody has said is he's called out the concerns that he has around unsolicited presentation mm. of superannuation products. And it's not, you know, the, the Commissioner is very clear about his view about not having a prohibition on particular types of entities in superannuation. And he was also very clear that he was not in favour of banning vertical integration. The hulking provision, and, and as, as somebody who represents ASFA, we're concerned with the whole of the system. And Commissioner Hain was looking at the whole of the system. He wasn't just picking out one particular sector. He's talking about unsolicited offering of superannuations. And I think from that point of view, I think most people are welcoming it. Now, he has stopped short of rec recommending a, a singular regulator for super, although it gave some clarity perhaps to who should be responsible uh, for super because it wasn't clear between ASIC and APRA at times who was actually responsible for the governance. Are you happy with the, I suppose, the clarity around who is actually governing uh, and regulating the superannuation industry? As many of your viewers will know, we have the so-called Twin Peaks model of, of regulation which goes right back to Wallace and, and even earlier reviews. And that clearly separates prudential regulation from market conduct regulation. We have had very, very good history of regulation in this country and I think it's important to look and when we evaluate our rec regulators, look back over a long period. What the Commissioner has said is that there are certain lacunas or gaps in the regulation and he's very clearly signalling that APRA should have the mandate around prudential regulation, issues around solvency, issues around the, 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 the overarching suitability of our funds and the licensing, but the conduct issues and particularly the changes that are being proposed around the conduct and advice, etc. And what we've seen in the Commission has meant that ASIC will have a much more, I think, intrusive role in that area. And so I think that clarity, which is something the PC called out for, and which I think you know, industry bodies like ourselves have called for, will be helpful going forward. Are you expecting to see more regulatory action by ASIC as a result of this now on, on the super industry? Because some have said it's just really been, been lacking in the past. I think what you have to recognise is, and this is, has been repeated, that external evaluations, international assessments of our superannuation system have not pointed to systemic problems within the sector. Um, and so what we're seeing here is getting clarity. What this does is, the, the Commissioner's report is really an inflection point in the future of retirement saving. And what it's saying is that this regulatory architecture, which will make it fit for purpose for the future, is going to serve as well. And I think we're looking forward to working with the regulators and other stakeholders on how that starts to manifest itself. All right, Martin Faye, thanks so much for joining us. You're very welcome. Well, in company news, Microsoft Australia is working with the New South Wales government to develop a whole of government artificial intelligence strategy. Announced yesterday at the company's technology centre launch in Sydney, Microsoft will help the government implement ethical frameworks and develop more people-focused services. For more on what this means, Tiki Fullerton sat down with Microsoft Australia Managing Director Stephen Worrell a short time ago. 
Stephen Warren, nice to chat. Now, this Microsoft Technology Center, the launch this week, right in the middle of the CBD, how important a, a move is it for you from an investment point of view in Australia? Well, it's obviously a very big investment, and we think a really important one for our customers, both government and also private sector, to use as a tool on their ongoing journey to transform the way in which they operate their organizations. Okay, unpack that for me, yeah. if you can. Who, who are we talking about here, and how can you help? Well, today we also announced a partnership with New South Wales government to help them in a variety of ways in applying technology. Uh, so going forward, we'll have the New South Wales government here in the NTC working with us on cybersecurity issues, uh, working on ways in which we can apply AI in an ethical and trusted way in government across the state and also finding other ways in which we can use data in a more effective way to improve the quality of services that we, we all use as citizens of New South Wales. Mm. So what's one example? Uh, I know that federally Angus Taylor, when he was working on in the city's portfolio federally, was, was working a lot in this space and how to get, uh, I suppose, the, the bureaucrats yeah up to speed um, so that they can offer services efficiently to the public. Uh, there's a lot of talk today about capability. I think that's the key issue, right? It's about the, the skills and the, and the uh, confidence people have in using technology. And one of the real benefits of the Technology Centre is that we'll be working side by side with members of the New South Wales government and other governments, for that matter, from around the country to help think through the challenges that they're facing and then find ways in which we can logically use technology to help improve the services that are provided. Mm. Um, I, I think our leadership, our, our government leadership, have a clear vision for where we're going. Um, now we're into the real issues of how do you how do you help people adopt it? Yeah. So this MOU is with the Department of uh, Financial Services uh, Innovation. Presumably there'll be a lot of work on open banking which is coming in this year. Yeah, there will. Obviously we're working closely with the banking industry today and the intersection with government is very clear. So that's a, an area for us to work side by side with government. But there are many areas, uh, you know, pretty much every aspect of the service that government provides today is going to be looking at uh, delivering it through a digital context, so whether cyber security is being considered appropriately, whether there are new ways of using technology to improve the quality of that service. Uh, I think banking is just one of the intersection points. There are many. Mm. Can you give me some examples, because you've also got, uh, what, 10,000 partners right. in Australia, right. so uh, will all of them potentially have access to this centre and how would they use it in terms of problem solving? Yeah, but I think one of the benefits of the Technology Centre is that it does become a focal point for, for those partners to, to leverage in the partnership with Microsoft. Uh, we ultimately see ourselves as a platform company, so we're providing some basic technology that our partners will build IP and other services on top that governments and the private sector might use. So you bet, this is a place uh, in addition to the Sydney Startup Hub, which we announced last year, as you may remember, yes, yes. Uh, working side by side with the startup community to find new ways of using technology to help create those new organisations of the future. How's that going, by the way? Going very well. Uh, and again, a great investment by New South Wales government in, in uh, providing the, the space for the, for the precinct. And obviously, we're delighted to be partnered with the, the government in, in pursuing all the benefits that come from working with the, the tech and startup community. Mm. So you're talking about a sort of holistic approach that you're, you've got with, with the government uh, there. Uh, needless to say, AWS, Google will presumably be offering not dissimilar services. What puts uh, Microsoft uh, ahead in your view? Look, I think the combination of our 10,000 partners in the country, obviously that's a really important asset that we feel we bring to the, the table. Um, investments we've made not only here with the Technology Centre, but now Sydney is one of eight cities around the world where our startup program is being run. Uh, we've invested side by side with Sydney University in a quantum computing lab, which we think is really important. Uh, we've also invested in some new data centres down in Canberra that provide the critical national infrastructure, not only for government, but also for uh, some really important industries, food, utilities, uh, and so forth. So. I think it's a combination of those investments, the partner network, uh, and obviously the tenure that we've had here in Australia as a long-term member of the Australian business community. Yeah, so that all these separate investments which you've been sort of rolling out, uh, we've chatted to the, about them over the, over the months, I know, um, but that's all starting now to, um, you, you know, look like a bit of a grid and work work together. Well, very much so. It's a long-term commitment. We've been here for more than 30 years and we expect to be here for another 30 or, or more or longer. And it's part of Microsoft's commitment to ensure that we help position Australia to profit from this unique moment. And you've got another uh, big uh, partner coming on board this week. Yes, yes. So DXE were also here this morning to announce a five-year commitment that they've made to the Microsoft platform. 
Yeah, and they're a bit, pretty big player. They're a massive player. So one of the largest players in the outsourcing market worldwide. Uh, and the commitment to our platform is a great validation of what Azure, which is our cloud platform, yes. brings to the market. And we look forward to working side by side with them uh, and their clients to deliver all the benefits that will come from using the latest cloud technology. Stephen, when you come to AI and people talk, talk the talk on, on ethics and AI, um, it's really hard to grapple with walking the walk on that. Um, there's a lot of, uh, from a business point of view, I find um, sort of washing, if I could use it like that, but businesses saying, oh yes, we do machine learning, and yes. you sort of think, well, do they? Yes. What is machine learning? Yes. And do they actually do it and deliver it? How does the public, how do customers, how does the media grapple with that? Yeah. Look, I think it's a massive issue. Uh, the industry, the IT industry is talking a lot about AI and machine learning. And what we're hoping to achieve through the Microsoft Technology Center here is to bring together government, but obviously also our private sector clients to sit down side by side with Microsoft experts to work out how to implement those sorts of solutions in a meaningful and trusted way. Yeah. Yep, so that it's credible and people understand what you... I think that's ultimately what it's about. I mean, we all use some level of technology, some uh, extensively, others not so much, but what we all want to have is a trusted service. When we use whatever it is over our, our smartphone or whatever service we use, we want to know that our information is protected, that privacy controls are in place, and that our information is being used as we expect it to be used. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a collaboration between the IT industry and government and our customers to ensure that that is well understood by, uh, by all constituents and that it isn't just the industry saying, trust me, the technology has everything you need it to have. Are you charging partners uh, for this service or how is that going to work? In working here in the Microsoft Technology yeah. Center? No, this will be part of their uh, partnership with us. Uh, obviously, it depends on the nature of the engagement. We expect some uh, engagements might be a meeting where we have a client and a partner working together. That could extend into days or weeks based on the nature of the work that they're doing and obviously those um, terms and conditions we get into as we, we get to the specific details. Now, uh, just globally, um, I note it's uh, your CEO Satya Nadella's uh, five-year anniversary, I think, this week. Uh, now, Microsoft appears to be uh, ever more on the front foot witness, no doubt, the gazillions it spent in that, with that uh, Super Bowl advert. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Well, look, I think we, we are an organization that has continued to change. Uh, we talk a lot about change with our customers, and we uh, have been through enormous change ourselves over the last few years and continue to change. Ultimately, we only exist to serve our customers. Do you feel, though, you're getting traction, um, both here in Australia and indeed globally, by uh, the, the, the line about trust? I mean, there have been other um, fangs, uh, you know, particularly Google and Facebook, who've had their major issues and continue to do so, really, over, over trust. It's been quite a deliberate strategy, I think, to try and distance yourself. Is that having traction with clients, do you think? I think it's, it's less of a line. It's more about principle led uh, a principle-led organization and uh, many people have commented on such as leadership and tenure at Microsoft but I, I think the primary aspect of his leadership has been it's very principle-led and the idea of trust and the idea of transparency is definitely not a line it is uh, consequential to Microsoft it's central to who we think we are uh, we know it's important to everyone that we serve and ultimately that's that's why we're so committed to ensuring that trust and transparency the ethical use of technology, uh, the fact that we want to uh, level the playing field for constituents across all different parts of our community, not deliver benefits for the select few. Yes. That's fundamental to who we are as a company. Yep. Uh, what does he think of Australia? You must talk to him about it. Um, he loves the fact that we are fascinated and obviously d deeply involved in the game of cricket. So if you ever <laughs> meet Satya, you just need to talk to him about cricket because that's most of my conversations. Yeah, we need to get better first before I do well, that. I haven't actually been raising it with him recently, but uh, he was very interested in the ball tampering scandal last year. Was. That was a, a subject of much, much discussion and consternation, I might say, as a a cricket lover, he was very concerned about the state of Australian cricket. But yes. uh, no, I, I think he, he sees Australia as a, an organ as a country that's transforming rapidly. Yes. And I think he, like me, sees the opportunity for us to play an important role in helping governments and, and our, our clients across the country achieve their vision and achieve their goals. I hope the Hyderabad boy gets out here sometime this year. It'd be really good to uh, catch up with him. You bet. Stephen Worrell, thank you very much. Thanks, Dickie. Well, after the break, Virgin Australia named their new CEO with outgoing chief John Borghetti set to leave the embattled airline in March. We'll get more details with the Australian senior business writer John Drury next. Now, back 
to Tiki. Welcome back. Well, it's the end of an era at Virgin Australia with current CEO and MD John Borghetti stepping down as expected and Paul Scurra coming in as his replacement. For more, I'm pleased to welcome John Jury, Senior Business Commentator at The Australian. John, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Leah. Now, can I get you a read initially on this Virgin story? Paul Scurra, uh, where's he come from and what do you make of this appointment? I, I think it's, it's a good move. He, he's got an extraordinarily wide background, mainly in the logistics, but also the aviation area. He's worked everywhere from Flight Centre to his current job at DP World, Qantas, ANSET, uh, some time at Horizon. So, as he says, he spent a lot of time working out how to move people and goods around, which is, when you think of it, what Virgin does. What do you think the future of Virgin as a listed company is in Australia? There's a lot of talk that they'll go private. There's only 10% of that that's floated in Australia anyway. Surely there's not a huge benefit to them being a public company. Yeah, there's not a huge benefit. You're quite right, and it should be, should be privatised as soon as possible. Th that, to me, is the big challenge ahead of SCARA. I think John Bor Borghetti, in his eight years there, did a fantastic job of essentially creating a new airline and a very viable and sustainable competitor to Qantas. Uh, he, he hasn't quite delivered the earnings growth we would have liked, but then, you know, he, he's up against an incredibly tough... Yeah. competitor against an iconic behemoth like Qantas. But, but the, 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 share, the real danger that he's got is the share register because you've got four airlines and the airlines they bring um, controlling 80% of the company and then Richard Branson another uh, 7 or 8%. And, and it's very diff And two of those airlines are struggling so they don't have any money. And so it's very hard to get one or more of them to sort of push the button on a privatisation. And, and that is really what should happen. Yeah, and the risk of one of the big Chinese airlines pulling out altogether, I think, as well. But look, let's move on to banking. That's right. uh, you wrote a very interesting piece this morning uh, on the Royal Commission. Firstly, I want to ask you, in the short term, Andrew Thorburn, perhaps to a lesser extent Ken Henry, because he's probably harder to get rid of, but Andrew Thorburn, can he survive? I, I think he can survive, but look, I, uh, it's interesting. I mean... When, when, when you come down to it, who's Ken Hayne? He's the Royal Commissioner. He, he's just delivered a report based on evidence given by the banks. And so I, I think we should actually give Andrew Thorburn and Ken Henry some time in, in the chair to let them run the bank mm. because that's, after all, what they're doing. And, and, and they're, you know, th they're promising to, to deliver on, on, on exactly what Ken Henry wants. And so I, I think we'd be wrong to write them off just because of a few paragraphs in the, uh, yeah. uh, by Ken Hayne in his report. Now, obviously, the banks did very well yeah. yesterday. As you yeah. pointed out, you weren't surprised. Not many of yeah. us were surprised that they, were, that they bounced. But the, did the extent of the bounce surprise you? Uh, well, not really when you consider there was a big short position on, mm. on the estimate I had. It was like $7 billion, And so, that, you know, there was a, a lot of money burnt. There was, a, there, was a, there was an extraordinary amount of press co coverage, uh, analyst coverage of, of the Royal Commission and what it meant for the sector. One of the analysts said to me today, well, that was $150 million just flushed down the toilet because it was a complete waste of time. I happen to think that particular analyst, although I regard him highly, is, is wrong because I think the report's been, been, uh, has been a very valuable exercise. Yes, well, on the report, okay. I mean, you didn't consider it a failure, unlike some, okay. uh, because it didn't uh, go hard enough against uh, vertical integration or didn't recommend specific charges. Of course, it's not a, a Royal Commission's job to charge people. It did feel like a bit like the French Revolution or something sometimes. There weren't enough kind of heads on yeah. sticks. Uh, ultimately, you, you thought it was a successful document. I, I do. I, I mean, yeah, my, my gut reaction was it was a little bit soft. Because, yeah. I mean, in part, in part, I must admit, my uh, originally didn't think we really needed a Royal Commission. I changed my view, and as I say, I think it was a valuable exercise you know, with the benefit of hindsight. He, he has recommended to ASIC that they take a couple of criminal actions, and we don't really know yet which um, bankers are involved in that. I, I've spoken with 
both NAB and um, ANZ say that they're not aware of it. Matt Common, when he was asked today, said he didn't want to talk about it. And uh, we know that Westpac was the only one of the big four who didn't, who, who didn't um, get any sort of referrals or anything against them. So, so take your pick. Um, the, the, the speculation is running that it, you know, it, it'll be out of AMP, NAB and CBA who get the criminal prosecutions. Mm. But that's now all before uh, our success. So, so th there have been changes. But, but I, I think the fundamental benefit of the Royal Commission was that it, it, it shone the, the public spotlight on, on a really an incredibly lazy oligopoly that's been mm. able to get away with blue murder for too long. And I think for that reason, it's to be commended. Yeah, well, John Jury, thanks so much for joining yeah. us. A great piece yeah. today. Great. Well, that's all the time we have for this evening. Tomorrow night, I'll be speaking with Mervac CEO Susan Lloyd. Horrets on the company's half-year results. Until then, thanks for your company.